What's up guys, Jay's Two Cents here, and uh, we're gonna have a little bit of a talking head video today. This is not intended to be new news about, G, uh, I almost said G, but DDR5. Uh, it's about some of the benefits you're gonna see versus DDR4, the platform thoughts you have to take into mind. Inevitably, this always happens. They announce a product or they announce a new spec or a new family of products way in advance, time ellipses or lapses, whichever, and then right before it launches, you start going through that panic of like, oh crap, should I upgrade to this? Is it worth it? I don't know. I, I just, so today we're gonna have some food for thought. We're gonna talk about it, talk about some of the specs, some of the things to expect versus DDR4 and the use cases where you might actually want to consider upgrading to a DDR5 platform. Bring your entire setup together with IQ from Corsair. Customize lighting effects by choosing from a vast selection of presets or create your own using custom lighting features allowing you to synchronize your battle station to your own taste and style. IQ also allows for full system monitoring and control including fan speeds, lighting and more, all from a single interface. To see all that IQ from Corsair has to offer, follow the sponsored link in the description below. So starting off, we need to talk about some of the improvements of DDR5 versus DDR4. DDR5 is a uh, quite a bit of a jump over DDR4, more so than how DDR4 felt like over DDR3, although the jumps might look similar in terms of percentage changes. We are seeing some a pretty extreme upticks here. So in terms of the data rates, um, 1600 to 3200 megatransfers per second when it comes to DDR4. And remember, the speed over a family of RAM, the generation of RAM, increases as the manufacturing process improves, as the yields improve, you'll find that it gets faster. So for instance, DDR4 launched at 2133 being the, the, the speed. And then you would see um, 2400 dims and then 2600 and then 2800 and then 3000 and then 32 and then 34, 36. And it's like 200 megahertz bumps every time. So when you see a range like this in terms of the uh, transfers per second, then it's kind of accounting for that type of speed improvement. Um, DDR5, however, its baseline transfer rate is 3200. So that's where DDR4 fairly maxed out. That's where DDR5 starts. And we're seeing a 2x transfer rate improvement in DDR5 over DDR4, up to 6400 MTPS. So already that's massive. But the other side of the coin is the capacities. When DDR3 was phased out for DDR4, two gigabyte and four gigabyte sticks were fairly common. They did have eight gigabyte sticks of DDR3. So eight gigabyte sticks of DDR4 being the standard, uh, you know, four gigabyte sticks obviously were available, but eight gigabyte kind of became the standard that people were getting. Wasn't that much of a capacity improvement. Most motherboards would guarantee to support 64 gigs of RAM. Some motherboards would go as high as 128 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, but that was, it, it depended on the motherboard, depended on the platform. What I mean by that is you had mainstream, right, which was like a standard Intel CPU or even a Ryzen CPU, uh, didn't support nearly as much RAM as say a quad channel board like X299 or even Threadripper would support. So that's why you see those ranges there. But we're seeing four times the capacity per, per uh, chip on DDR5 versus DDR4. So DDR4's single DIMM, like one stick of RAM maxed out at 32 gigabytes. We're seeing eight gigabytes to 64 gigabytes per stick, per stick. So what that means is you could have two sticks of RAM and have 128 gigabytes of memory. Now there's a lot of other stuff that we could talk about here in terms of boost length, refresh uh, commands, all the bank groups, all that sort of stuff. You can essentially just assume everything has either doubled or quadrupled, doubled or quadrupled, depending on the spec. And that, that is a massive, improvement. The best part about it all is it's doing it with less voltage. So 1.5 volts uh, was fairly the standard, was pretty much a standard for DDR3. DDR4 was 1.2 volts. Now we're seeing 1.1 volts as the standard for DDR5. So you're seeing double the data rate, quadruple the amount of RAM chips on the DIMM, and it's doing it with less voltage. So that's, that's just it's awesome to see Moore's Law is, is still alive and well. Now, should you upgrade to DDR5 or DDR5 platform? Well, the first thing you have to understand is to adopt DDR5 means you're gonna have to adopt an entirely new platform. The new RAM, obviously, a new CPU and a new motherboard. So if you're gonna be building an Alder Lake system anyway, 
you're probably gonna want to just get DDR5 if the price isn't completely astronomical. We've seen, unfortunately, DRAM prices tend to kind of go through this sort of a sine wave, sort of a, sort of a pattern where when they first launch, they're extremely expensive and then they become the norm and they come way down. And then now obviously everything's expensive because of obvious reasons. Launching a brand new platform when there's limited availability of chips and dies means it's probably gonna launch dollar per gigabyte much higher than we saw with DDR4. Which I guess means you could save a few bucks if you get a new platform like the Alder Lake system or whatever AMD is gonna launch that's gonna obviously use DDR5 as well. You could save some money by running DDR4. No word yet on whether or not DD, uh, AMD is gonna backwards support on their platform DDR4 and DDR5, just like Intel is doing. I would have to assume they're gonna do that if Intel can do it. But you would save a little bit of money by running DDR4 in the meantime, and then when prices come down, upgrade to DDR5, and you, know, you would see that uptick in performance. So already you're buying a new CPU, you're buying a new motherboard. That doesn't seem worth it if you just want to adopt DDR5, if your tasks that you're doing are not going to leverage that RAM speed. And now, it's not just RAM speed, it's capacity as well though. But if you're doing something like video editing or Photoshop or 3D modeling, all three of those have a very different requirement when it comes to system memory and how it's accessed. We'll talk about video rendering first, um, since that's the one that obviously we do more of around here. Most people rendering uh, or doing video editing are gonna probably have 32 to 64 gigabytes of uh, system RAM, fast mem memory, and having more of it is not gonna help your render time. So it's only gonna help you during your actual accessing of the footage while you're in your timeline. Photoshop editors or photo editors on the other hand, especially if you're dealing with like raw files or very large format files or you deal with 40 megapixel files, that's a massive amount of data that's trying to be accessed at one time. Especially if you're trying to access an entire library, all of that wants to be stored into memory. Because as you see the preview and as you load the file, it gets loaded into memory and you can swap between them faster. Now, if you have four times the memory capacity and you have twice the speed, that's obviously going to potentially give you much more productivity, less downtime, less waiting, which is going to equal productivity. Gamers are probably not gonna benefit from this in any way whatsoever. Gamers are gonna definitely benefit from the E-Core, P-Core thing that we saw on Intel, and hopefully AMD brings something similar to that sort of concept. That way you have essentially two completely separate CPU types that are doing different things independent of each other without giving you any sort of slowdown where one has to wait on the other. That's gonna be far more beneficial than the actual memory itself. So we definitely are gonna do some con content with Alder Lake when it comes up of DDR4 versus DDR5 on the same platform when it comes to gaming. 3D modeling, let's talk about that one. 3D modeling is 100% graphics card dependent. It's all done on the graphics card. Any 3D modeler will tell you graphics card. I mean, we've, we've done tests where we've showed how CPU is like eight times slower. And it's for the reasons that we just mentioned. Fast access RAM, GDDR6X is extremely fast, way faster than any system RAM. 24 gigabytes on something like the 3090 or 16 gigabytes on like a, a 6900 XT is gonna give you the frame buffer that you need to be able to render out those scenes. Remember, when it comes to 3D modeling, it's essentially doing ray tracing one frame at a time. And if you're doing a, a, a 3D scene, if you will, where it moves or whatever, it's one frame at a time where it does all that math and it all takes place on the graphics card. System memory, although it has its requirements when it comes to those programs, all the work is being done on GPU. So there's probably gonna be a lot less of a benefit there than having say some ridiculously overpowered uh, productivity card, like some Quattro or Tesla or something out there versus um, you know, having a fast CPU and fast memory to go along with it. I still fully believe that it's the Photoshop editors and the photographers that are gonna see the full benefit of DDR5 versus DDR4. But your entire system snap, you know, responsiveness is also going to improve with DDR5. The amount of RAM, the amount of stuff that could be placed in RAM before it has to go to a page file and swap it to the disk, and the speed of it. I mean, we're talking DDR5 8400 mo uh, modules are, are, are potentially on the horizon. But we're seeing modules that are gonna be starting somewhere in the 6000 platform. I mean, the fastest RAM we have in this office right now, which is $900 per dual, ch or dual stick, two channel, is the Crucial 5100. 5100, and we're talking about starting speeds there in 6,000 with DDR5, right out of the gate. So you wanna talk about the amount of speed we're gonna see with RAM. Also too, advancements in RAM like this are gonna advance the, uh, the, the way that 
developers can actually leverage and access that RAM. If you like to play with RAM disks, it can be the fastest disk on the planet as soon as DDR5 comes out. Anyway, just a little food for thought here. DDR5, people have been asking me whether or not it's a platform worth upgrading to because later this month, Alder Lake announcements are happening. There's no secret there. Everyone knows it's coming. And because we're only a few weeks away from that, people are starting to really now pay attention to DDR5 and they're asking whether or not it's worth upgrading to. So there you go, guys. Are you upgrading to DDR5? It means you're adopting Intel. Are you gonna wait for AMD to come out with something with DDR5? And if you specifically have a job or a workflow or a hobby or whatever, that can truly leverage that much RAM and that speed of it. And I'm not just talking about like VMs and stuff. Yeah, VMs, obviously, the, the more RAM, the faster the RAM, the better, because it's all being shared. What's a real world use case scenario where you are excited about DDR5 because it's literally gonna make your life easier? Sound off in the comments below. As always, guys, subscribe so you don't miss any of the 31 days of Jay. And don't forget about our massive uh, three card giveaway, GPU giveaway that we are doing that's worldwide. You'll find a link down in the description below.